It's often blamed for many things. Are you a young working professional not being able to buy a house? It is its fault. Does it destroy pristine ecosystems and depletes water resources of native people? Tick. Is it the favorite commodity for violent, deadly drug gangs and cartels? It is its fault. Avocado. An often blamed, yet surprisingly resilient fruit in popularity over the past few decades in our modern, interconnected Western world. Who can forget the 70s with their prong cocktails and avocados? This uh, prong cocktail is so entrenched in Britain's culinary landscape and people often assume it was invented here. Bernie Inns, the chain of mock Tudor restaurants that dominated dining out in uh, the post-war Britain, has been credited with uh, inventing the dish. And so has uh, Fanny Craddock. But um, in fact, the prawn cocktail owns its origins in the 19th century miner in California. But yeah, one of the ingredients was also the avocado. And um, this fad, this uh, trend for avocados, started again in earnest in the early noughties. And is it a millennial fad? Or actually avocado is an ancient, revered food of the Mesoamerican civilizations? It was considered a symbol of strength and fertility for the Aztecs. The name in Nahuatl, which is the native language of uh, Aztecs, is um, Ahuacatl, which means testicle. Who doesn't love a creamy guacamole, an avocado spread on a sourdough toast with scrambled eggs and tangy feta cheese, or served with a smoked salmon, or crab and avocado tostadas with a squeeze of lime? Such a versatile fruit, tasty, good for you, and of course, suitable for vegetarians and vegans. The first published record of what we know now as, a, as the avocado is in the report of Martin Fernandez de Encisco, who observed in 1519, so just about 500 years ago, that this fruit was commonly grown in the vicinity of Santa Marta, Colombia. Enciso's description occurs in the first book published after the discovery of New World, Summa de Geografia, published in Seville, Spain. And Cisco accompanied the great navigator and cartographer Juan de la Cosa in the first extensive exploration of the New World. He described the avocado that he saw in one of the small harbors at the foot of Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. Before reaching Santa Marta is Yajaro, which lies at the foot of the snow mountains. Yajaro is a good port with good lands and here are groves of many different sorts of edible fruits. Among others is one which looks like an orange and when it is ready for eating it turns yellowish. That which it contains is like butter and is of marvelous flavor, so good and pleasing to the palate that it is a marvelous thing. In 1526 his Fumario de la Natural Historia de las Indias, a brief account prepared at the request of the king, who was desirous of knowing as much as possible about the wonders of the New World, went like this. On the mainland are certain trees called pear trees, but they are like not those in Spain, though held in no less esteem. Rather is their fruit of such nature that they have many advantages over our pears. They are large trees with broad leaves similar to those of the laurel, but larger and more green. The bear pears weighing a pound or even more, though some weight less, and the color and the shape is that of a true pear, and the rind somewhat thicker, but softer, and in the center of the fruit is a seed like a peeled chestnut, and between this and the rind is the part which is eaten, which is abundant, and is a paste very similar to butter, and very good eating, and of good taste, and such that those who have these fruits guard them and esteem them highly, and the trees are wild, as are the others which have mentioned, for the chief gardener is God, and the Indians apply no work whatever to them. These pear trees are excellent when eaten with cheese, and they are gathered before they are ripe, and stored, and they are treated, thus they ripen perfectly for eating, but after they have reached this stage they spoil quickly, if allowed to stand. Avocados have a long, long history and tradition in the ancient uh, American civilizations. Classical Mayans, so the 14th classic Maya month, is represented by the glyph for the avocado. And uh, the same glyph, translated as un, 
in this context appears in the sign at the classic Maya city Pushilha, the site of a complex society in the present-day Belize. This is known as the Kingdom of the Avocado due to the main sign of the city's emblem being the glyph of the avocado, and its rulers would have been the lords of the avocado. The sign at Pusilha is very similar to that of a Quiringua, leading archaeologists to hypothesize that they belong to the same polity, but others have pointed to major differences that suggest otherwise. In any case, Maya ancestors are reborn as trees, and people would surround their houses with fruit trees sometimes over the graves of relatives. The ancestral orchard shows the rebirth of ancestors as trees in the Maya cosmological landscape. And um, some of these trees were uh, obviously the avocado trees and um, a lot of uh, this um, mythology surrounds that some uh, kings will emerge as, as an avocado tree later on. So yeah, Welcome uh, to the Delicious Legacy podcast. Another archaeogastronomical adventure today takes place and we are talking about the amazing avocado tree and the amazing fruits that it produces and how this um, tree travelled uh, the world and conquered everybody's um, breakfast table from uh, Mexico all the way to our tables here and beyond to Australia and New Zealand and uh, North America and so on. I had a fascinating discussion with um, Honor Eldridge uh, about her new book, The Avocado Debate, which is released um, pretty soon, on the 24th of November. So join us and let's find out more about the history and the current um, controversies of the avocado. I would like to thank all of my Patreon backers for their support all this time. And I would like to welcome... A new patron, Ryan Dome, and thank him for his um, recent support. Um, and of course, the rest of you too. Because without you, I wouldn't be able to do this. Hello, Honor. Welcome to the Delicious Legacy podcast. Hi, it's really great to be here. And um, we are here because you have... Uh, a book coming out. I do. Uh, my book, The Avocado Debate, is being published at the end of November, and it looks at the history of avocados, the way that we consume them, the impacts that their production have, basically all and everything avocado. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, before we go into the book. Uh, who are you? What you've been doing? And why you chose to write about this subject? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a food systems expert. I kind of look at agriculture, farming, food production, everything from farm to fork and have advised different organisations, different governments on food policy, farming policy for my career. But the more I thought about avocados, the more fascinating they became. I can't really think of any other fruit that represents an entire generation somehow in our mind. And it, the way it sort of captured the zeitgeist and popular culture was just sort of endlessly fascinating to me. And I just found that I kept on getting asked about avocados. Um, <laughs> people were really interested in them. And so eventually I thought, well, why not write a book? Great. <laughs> it's a good subject as subject go. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I thought about it quite a lot before you contacted me about, um, before I had, we had our chat about uh, uh, the interview here. I was thinking about, yeah, doing something either about Mexican food, the history, pre-Colombian history of Mexican food, or focusing on something like avocado or corn specifically, some specific things which are obviously American, uh, Mesoamerican mm -hmm. foods that came after Colombian exchange. And um, yeah, avocado is, um, there was so many strands I could find and they link a lot to modern history, to how we are commodifying and make it as a globalized um, ingredient for everybody's table today. And so I think your book um, <laughs> hits a nerve uh, <laughs> Right on. Exactly. And I think, you know, it has this incredibly long history, as you said, from, from prehistory, Mesoamerican, pre-Columbian history of being really integrated into Mexican and Central American food cultures. But it's also gained in popularity and around the world enormously in the last 
sort of 10 years. And so it has this kind of fascinating combination of being incredibly relevant today and yet having this really sort of long, detailed history. Um, and the balance of the two is is kind of fascinating. Mm. I was trying to think about any other fruit like this. And the only thing I could think is maybe pineapple in the 17th century, like it was a fad exactly. and very expensive. But, so kind of not the same, but... Yeah, I mean, I think the the pineapple and the kind of history of putting it on buildings as decoration and being a sort of sign of of wealth and conspicuous consumption, it probably does have some some similarities. In terms of sort of sustainability, I, I think there are kind of interesting parallels with, say, like the banana or kind of the sort of interest that people had around chocolate mm. in the 90s. And suddenly it kind of becomes a bit of a sort of shortcut to talk about sustainability and equitable food systems and, and where these kind of foreign exotic foods are coming from. But the kind of fascinating thing about the avocado is it a bit like the pineapple, I suppose. It's a raw ingredient. You, you tend to sort of think of an avocado as an avocado, whereas corn um, gets kind of combined into lots of ingredients or, or wheat or any mm. of these other commodity crops. They're sort of something that is an ingredient, whereas the avocado sort of sits alone and it's on its toast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about we start uh, with a bit of a deep history of avocado, sure. like pre-human, let's say. So the the avocado is is kind of fascinating um, from a sort of prehistory perspective and the way that it evolved because it has this enormous seed right at the center of it that if you think about other fruit that has sort of smaller seeds they can be digested by birds or small mammals and then they're defecated and they get spread and, and so that the fruit can kind of spread around the world and but with the avocado it's got such a huge stone you're not seeing any small mammals <laughs> swallowing that and surviving and that's because it actually evolved to be spread by megafauna in the sort of prehistory and so you'd get mega sloths and these really large animals that were sort of moving around Central America that would swallow the whole pit, you know, the whole fruit and the whole pit whole, um, walk 100 miles and and then defecate there. And so the avocado could spread. And there's this sort of fascinating sort of period where actually the megafauna go extinct. You don't see them in the region anymore, but you don't yet quite have Homo sapiens being at a point of doing agriculture and being able to sort of cultivate the avocado. So there's this sort of weird period where the avocado kind of just exists on luck and sort of inadvertently sort of manages to survive when when many other crops might have, have failed and gone mm. extinct. And from there... Uh, we jump a few million years, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and we go to the pre-Columbian uh, America, Mesoamerica, with Mayans, with Mayans, with the Aztecs, with a lot of the um, kind of indigenous groups that were in Central America at the time. Um, so the home of the avocado, the, the place that we first sort of associate it, and that's the first sort of history of it is in Puebla, Mexico. Where is Puebla in Mexico today? And so a lot of the groups there kind of really revered the avocado and we see as being part of their cultures, part of their food traditions. But so much of that history has kind of been exterminated and extinguished due to the arrival of sort of the colonial period and, and the Spanish into that region. And so a lot of the sort of texts and and histories of those peoples have been lost. Um, mm. And so it's a bit of guesswork to see how the avocado might have fitted into their world. But certainly there's a lot of indication that it had a really important role and was sort of part of that kind of early, early history of the region. Do we know any uh, anything about how they ate it? Um, or have any clues? I mean, really, the, the the way that we eat it today, <laughs> you know, it's pretty delicious raw. You don't really have to do a lot to it. Yeah. And it's a very calorific food. You know, it's it's got a lot of really good nutritional value. It's got a lot of fat. It's very filling. And so actually you can see how it would become a very kind of core element of a diet because you don't need very many of them to fill up and, and you're going to be fairly healthy by eating them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess, yeah, they had some um, corn tortillas, what they made in pre columbia Mexico, some squash, yeah, that, that yeah. kind of diet. Exactly. Of the, diet. The, the, so there's the concept of like the three sisters, which is your beans, your squash and your maize. And 
the avocado kind of fits in with that tradition. Mm. And so that kind of sustainable model of growing crops in rotations so that they all kind of support each other. And you have foods coming through at different parts of the harvest and parts of the year that can sustain you. But there was definitely in Puebla, Mexico, you saw that they tried to preserve avocados. So they knew that the they were going to be going into the winter period. There wasn't going to be as much food around. And so there are some antiquities that show that um, they were trying to preserve avocados in the caves so that they could eat them through the through the leaner times. Of course, yeah. How fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh... The Spanish arriving. Yes, the Spanish then arrived and everything changed in every aspect of society and including in the in the history of the avocado. Do you have any evidence of what happened so then? The, I mean, the, the you know, it happens in kind of waves, right? So the, you have the arrival and there's a lot more kind of curiosity and they kind of are documenting what is happening. And this is the Spanish. This is also all of the other colonial forces at the time and, and the powers that be. And so there's a lot of kind of reporting back from the new world back to the old world about the amazing sort of abundance of of plants and foods and people and and history that they are encountering for the very first time. And so that's how we get these sort of first explanations and accounts of of what the avocado is um, that are coming back to Spain, to Portugal and to the UK primarily. But then they start to sort of use the avocado and kind of as their as the sort of colonial period continues and you're having them more of the Spanish living there um, they start to consume it themselves mm. and start to kind of combine it with some European tastes so one of the things was that um, the Spanish really missed their olives and so what they decide to do to sort of try and replicate the taste in very different climate that doesn't have any olives is that they would pick very unripe, avocados, peel them and then brine them um, so that they could have the flesh um, would sort of replicate the olive a little bit. Um, I'm not sure I'd want it in my paella, but (laughs) a different kind of fusion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) How interesting. (laughs) So we have that um, yeah documented in um, America and then obviously the fruit travels around a bit in Europe, uh, yeah. a bit in North America. So so you have a bit like the the pineapple for a while the avocado is this sort of sign of conspicuous consumption for the Europeans. Right. It comes back, you know, it, it's considered to be a bit of an aphrodisiac, a bit of an exotic fruit. And so uh, European courts are sort of all over the avocado and um, Louis XV refers to it as the the good pair, le bon poire, um, because he thinks it's, you know, going to improve his sexual libido, um, <laughs> which was famed. So it, it starts to get a bit more notoriety as a food in, in Europe. But at the same time, the colonial system has started to enslave people um, and has started to build up this plantation system um, of exploitation. And they realize that the avocado is a very filling food with a lot of nutritional value. It, people, it has a lot of fat, it has a lot of calories, people can work well on mm-hmm. it. And secondly, it doesn't take up a lot of space. The canopy um, of the tree is quite compact and you can plant it on fairly marginal land. It's also very well adapted to the areas in which they were having um, sugar plantations um, were arising. So you see the avocado kind of spread around the Caribbean and follow that spread of colonialism and um, enslavement across the world. So as the colonial systems expand into Mauritius into Indonesia into um, Australia and New Zealand the avocado follows with them right okay so throughout the world basically not exactly. just uh, Americas or Caribbean yeah yeah and yeah. actually it comes to the US a lot later than the rest of the world mm. um because of that sort of divide between between the sort of you've had the war of independence you've you've seen the um US move on so they don't have that kind of expansionism but eventually the avocado makes it to florida so a US diplomat was serving in Mexico um, and he was kind of interested in botany. And at the time, the State Department thought that this would be great. This would be a way for them to sort of learn more and, and see if what they can gain um, from a sort of economic sense. And so Henry Perrin goes out and, and reports back. 
and he finds the key lime and the avocado and decides that both of these might be very good crops for Florida. Um, and so then he start he brings them to Florida and starts cultivating them there, which is the sort of first arrival of the avocado into the continental U.S. Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> very succinct and very <laughs> detailed at the same time. Uh, history of um, the spread of avocado. Yeah, <laughs> and not avocado spread. <laughs> <laughs> Both, I guess. I mean, it, you know, it is. It's. The, the Spanish refer to it as the butter of the poor. Mm. So they already have this concept that you can kind of mash it and spread it on on toast or on bread or mm. on something. Yeah. Um, so there is always this slight concept of, of you know, avocado spread, um, <laughs> <laughs> even back in the, in the colonial period. Uh, great. So obviously for the book, you've done a lot of research, I would guess, and um, you, like, you try and find documents about um, about the early history but obviously we're talking about the, the book is also about modern history of avocado so how do we arrive in in a world that um, avocado is uh, ubiquitous in uh, every menu in, yeah. in, in europe <laughs> uk i mean how how i mean does it fit in our climate anyway so no so so i think you know it arrives in florida and the floridians are growing there citrus fruit really successfully. It's one of the biggest producers um, of, of fruit and veg in the US at the time. But then they kind of realize that it's it's quite a similar climate in California. California is rapidly kind of becoming the agricultural heartland of the US. And so it gets uh, transposed over there and, and they start growing avocados in, in Southern California. Are we talking about uh Early, late 19th century or? Early 20th. Early 20th. Yeah. Early 20th. And so in kind of 1915, 1920, the, the avocado is just starting to really kind of meet a niche in mm. California. And a group of growers get together um, in LA and meet uh, in a hotel and decide that what they want to do is try and increase the popularity of the avocado. So this isn't going to happen anymore just sort of by word of mouth and slowly, slowly, this is going to be a organized marketing campaign to promote the avocado. And they do what, you know, what they were doing in the dream factory of Hollywood in the 1920s. And they kind of decide that what they want to do is they want to change the name. So originally it was still being used aguacate, the Spanish, or it was the alligator pear, mm. um, which doesn't sound very delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they decide to adopt avocado and say, that's it. Everyone's going to use the word avocado now because it's going to be more applicable and more relatable. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to target white Anglo-Saxon Protestant housewives, tapping into, you know, the growing middle class in America, the housewife, um, and, and make it something that they want to buy. And so the other aspect that they have to kind of look at is at the time, there was a lot of racism and anti-Latino and Latinx sentiment around the states. And so they start trying to disassociate the avocado from Latino culture and start to try and make it seem more Anglo-Saxon. So that's when you start seeing recipes for avocado toast coming up. So it's no more talking about guacamole and like how good it is on, you know, with tortilla. It's about, you know, trying to make it more more white. More really. white, more European. More, more European, yeah. yeah. More Anglo-Saxon, as you say. Yeah. And then the other one, which I quite like, is that they there has been this sort of reputation of the avocado being an aphrodisiac and they sort of realized that sort of very proper housewives in 1920s America are not going to be seen buying you know bags full of <laughs> avocados if they're sort of associated with yeah uh, with desire um so they run this rather hilarious campaign where they uh, sort of explicitly say the avocado is not, I repeat, not <laughs> an aphrodisiac. Um, and I think there's a sort of subtle underplay that you might be dispelling it as a myth, but it also makes people think, well, I mean, maybe, maybe if they're that emphatic that it isn't, maybe, <laughs> maybe. it actually is. And it gives it this little edge of desire. I'll be back after this short break. Did we say what avocado means as a word? In, in, uh... Yeah, so it means testicle. 
Um, so it has, I mean, does look like one, I suppose, hanging on the tree, but it, it has always had this sort of association with, with sex and with desire. And there was, um, one of the records that we do have, um, from pre-Columbian period is that, um, there used to be a sort of a festival of avocados when they were being harvested Mm -hmm. in, in, with one particular society and women were actually banned from leaving the house at the time because they thought that the, um, just the scent of the avocado harvest would drive them wild. <laughs> um, and it was very, you know, there was a sort of bacchanal element to this harvest and, um, and nudity and, and sort of frenzy, which sort of perpetuated this sort of myth. Um, right. <laughs> and um, when a, a very, one of the, the men from California who wanted to sort of start commercializing um, and promoting the avocado, decided to go down to Mexico and Guatemala and, and sort of travel around and yeah. see if he could find find new varieties and, and sort of explore. And he sort of set himself this task and said well, that he was only going to eat avocados for a week. He was only going to eat avocados. But as a result, he got kicked out of his guest house because the woman who was running it thought that if he was only eating avocados, he would be a danger to her children <laughs> and her young girls oh um, <laughs> <laughs> because he would be <laughs> so lustful. Um, so <laughs> there is this kind of, yeah, funny, funny tension, this sort of connection. Yeah, I'm trying to think recently... We don't associate avocado with anything sexual. I mean, we think about oysters and yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't. It was it was there was a study about ten years ago where there was still about forty percent of respondents did associate avocados with with sexuality and desire oh, right, and, okay. and um, as an aphrodisiac. But it wasn't something I had ever associated with them. Um, so I was a bit surprised when I came across that study and <laughs> sort of missing out. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> do you like avocado? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah, the book is written with uh, <laughs> with love. It is written with love. <laughs> and of course, we need to say here that the book is not a polemic against uh, consumption of avocado. No, it's not. So I think, you know, when we get into the dialogue around the fruit today, there is a lot of sort of hostility towards them, you know, that they're very thirsty and they're taking water away from communities or, um, but it's, it's not the avocado's fault. Mm. It's the system in which we produce them. Um, so if you only grow avocados in a huge plantation and you apply a load of chemicals to them and you irrigate them with water that would otherwise go to a, a native community, yeah, of course, they're very damaging. Yeah. Um, but if you grow them in a sustainable way, in, integrated with other crops, and, and you grow them in a way that respects local communities and, and values them as well as part of that process, then they're no more damaging than any of the other products that we eat on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm not a farmer per se, but I'm, I guess any kind of monoculture, any kind of crop that you grow that way... It's going to be damaging. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's, it's you know... the same about almonds it's, in California. It's true of almonds. Almonds are really thirsty. You know, tomatoes in Spain, they have, yeah, yeah. they're thirsty. I mean... The huge greenhouses, Exactly, yeah. and, and you've got carbon. I mean, anything that you produce, it's going to have an impact. And some of those impacts can be more intense and some of those can be less depending on how you produce it and the mm. choices that you make. And so to me, with this book, it's just about understanding what, the scale is and and what impacts there are and how you mitigate them and so anyone can be more informed um when yeah. they go to tesco and they buy their then <laughs> buy their avocado they can know a little bit more about where it's come from mm. or, or how it's been produced and what that might mean for their food footprint cool um so obviously avocado we said it comes from mexico from mm-hmm. that area of uh, americas then goes to california then we have this um all campaign to make it more popular and uh, everybody can consume it and so on and so on. Today we get avocados from many places around the world, don't we? Yeah, so in the US, 90% of avocados still come from Mexico. So the US basically buys almost all of the avocados produced in Mexico. And from Mexico, they're actually 80% are produced in one region called Michoacan, um, which is sort of south southeast of Mexico City. But in the UK, we actually don't really import very many avocados from Mexico. Mm-hmm. We primarily get ours from Colombia, Peru, Israel, and South Africa. South Africa, okay. <laughs> I think I've, uh, I've definitely had, obviously, Chilean or 
yeah, Chilean or Peru, I'm not sure, uh, avocados, mm -hmm. uh, and from Spain and from Israel mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in UK. Yeah, South yeah. Africa's production is, is really increasing a lot. But what you're also seeing at the moment is that the climate is changing. Yeah. And so areas that weren't able to produce avocados before, because they are actually a very temperamental crop. They mm. do not like getting cold. They mm. do not like getting too hot. They need just the right amount of water. Um, so they're very picky. But because the European climate is changing, you're starting to see areas being able to sustain and support avocado production. So you're getting more avocados coming from Spain and Portugal. You're getting some from Crete now increasingly. Yeah. And so that's starting to change the picture of, of where avocados are coming from when they're imported into the UK. We're still not able to grow them here. <laughs> well, I've got news for you. <laughs> I mean, you probably know. I mean, the London wild avocado trees? Yeah. yeah. So there, there are the trees. The, the, yeah, there are the <laughs> we trees. can grow avocado <laughs> trees. And yeah, it's quite fun going around London and you can kind of spot one or two that are yeah. hidden here and there. But I don't think they're going to be uh, producing no. enough fruit to, not, no. not to sustain the North London <laughs> avocado brunch <laughs> habit. No, definitely not. Have you, have you gone around? Have you seen spotted, Sam? I've, I've gone to a couple of them. I really want to do it again and, and really it's sort of like tick a few more off but there are some beautiful ones and and you just don't really expect them to be there no um, yeah have you tried any fruits from london trees i tried one or i tried to pick one but it was very small and very ah. very hard yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> i can imagine yeah. um, wasn't going to be ripening anytime what, soon. what's the i don't know if it's an urban myth but i suppose it's from the 70s when avocado and what was prawn prawn um, um, yeah, the prawn cocktail. Prawn cocktail was... Uh, yeah. And people discarding seeds, I guess. Exactly. And, you know, I know people do them do them now. I mean, I've got friends who've got a little pit of an avocado with toothpicks in it suspended over a glass of water. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's amazing. You know, I think that is that is such a great thing to be able to kind of actually see where your food is being produced. I think, you know, from a food systems perspective consumers today like we we are so disconnected from our food and where it comes from and and how it's produced and so i love it the idea that you can have your avocado and then keep the seed and and start to grow a little sapling yourself it's fascinating yeah i mean I've, I've, so i had one like three years ago it grew for a couple of years then last winter died because of the cold and stuff so this summer i went and put um, like five or six avocado seeds on, on <laughs> with toothpicks and stuff so i have grow i started growing some saplings uh, uh like i probably have three or four now uh, little plants growing which is nice <laughs> and i hope they will last the winter the winter the winter is the killer i might have to bring them in the house oh, yeah but that's that's actually why we ended up so most people will kind of recognize the Hass avocado mm. um it's sort of the the one that you see most common in the uk it's got a, a sort of black skin that's very yeah. kind of knobbly and that became popular because it was more resistant to the cold mm. so there was a previous variety called the fuerte that was very popular across la um, and southern california but then they had a really bad winter with a really strong cold snap and all the trees died and so they kind of decided that they better try and find something that was a bit more resistant mm. to the cold and along came the Hass, and it's taken over it's it's yeah exactly it's the most popular by far. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, completely. And that's that's for a lot of reasons because of the cold. Um, it's also got a higher um, fat content and fat, mm. higher oil content. Okay. So it's really good for smashing on toast. Um, it's that hard skin. Um, it protects it from pests actually pretty well. So you that's can good. use less yeah. pesticides. Yeah. But it also makes it really resistant to chipping. Um, so part of the reason w that it became popular was that producers realized that they could ship it more easily um, because that hard skin kind of protected it a lot more um, than the green skinned variety that, mm. that bruised a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you start picking avocados and yeah. touching them, see if they're yeah. ripe and stuff. Yeah, I can imagine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, then it's going to completely destroy the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we get our avocados now from everywhere, but the Mexican avocado itself, there is there is... 
there are problems with uh, the growing of, of trees there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the monoculture, as I said, you know, that's problematic because it, it requires a lot of intensive inputs and intensive agricultural techniques like pesticides and like uh, fertilizers. And it also uses a lot of water in a, in a region that is increasingly water stressed. Um, so you're seeing local communities losing access to water supplies the other problem with it is because avocados are so profitable, more and more land is being switched over into avocado production, which means that more and more native forest in an area that is really biodiverse and, and has some of the most amazing species of, in the world um, is being converted into subsistence land because the people that live there have to eat something. They can't just eat avocados all the time. And, and most of those avocados are being shipped off to the US. And so that's having this kind of knock-on effect um, on the environment. But one of the more kind of sensational sides that that kind of get picked up a lot is the involvement of the drug cartels. Yeah, that was something that um, I wasn't aware of. And I mean, only recently, when the ban happened in um, USA, like a few years ago, mm -hmm. that's when I realized avocados have that dark side as well, not just... I mean, the reality, yeah, the, the reality is that the drug cartels have their fingers in every aspect of the Mexican economy. You yeah. cannot really find any industry in Mexico that isn't involved um, somehow. And it, it suddenly gained a lot of popularity and, and press coverage because there was an incident where a USDA official was held up at gunpoint by one of the cartels. And so this perpetuated um, the US temporarily banned imports of Mexican avocados and, and did that right around Super Bowl Sunday, to, mm. which impacted anyone who wanted their nachos while watching the big game. But it actually has its really long history. And Mishoacan, um has long been... Um, an area where the local community has connections to the cartels. Right. Um, and so this isn't something that just arose instantly, but they can now make more money growing avocados than they can growing marijuana. It's a lot safer because you, you're you not going to get the federales turning up to destroy your avocado crop, whereas you definitely would if you were growing marijuana. And it's a fairly easy way to start laundering your money yeah so you get a lot of investment from the cartels absolutely yeah that's that's the fascinating bit of like using avocados as the cartels you think but why the drunk cartels would use avocados because it's such an easy way to launder money that's the click that i made in 2021 about that yeah exactly it's you, you know and if you think about it if you were a young child who grew up in mashoa khan you've got limited choices you end up going into the cartel world, your family, your background is still in that region. Mm -hmm. So you want to buy the land and you, you know, it's it's what you know. And so you're seeing that money getting invested back in to the community, which creates this real tension because they don't all think of the cartels as being awful and terrible and violent. They think them of them as bringing money into yeah. a community that is poor. Yeah, and forgotten from, from the central government, from everybody else. And you think, yeah, exactly. you have to feed yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it, it's, it was one of the most interesting parts of researching it, actually, the kind of complexity of that relationship um, and how the communities there relate to the cartels, how deep those ties are into the community. Mm. And one of the, the gangs really kind of presented themselves as the protector of the Mishoacan people and and did what they could to sort of support communities. And, and so that created this really fascinating interplay between avocado production and the cartels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one that's tragically sad as well. You know, the violence is, is awful and as... The, you know, as the avocado is, is making more money and you're seeing that kind of wars between the cartels, the, the people are stuck in the middle as well. Um, and that violence spreads over um, and can really damage communities. I mean, I suppose that's beyond the scope of this podcast and your book, I suppose. <laughs> but I mean, how do you move uh, from the violence of drugs just been doing an avocado trade, I suppose? I don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I as mean... a person who has the land and... I suppose, you know, that's part of, of understanding where your avocado comes from. And and so when it was in the news a lot more about the USDA agent, cafes in, in London and in the UK 
sort of announced that they weren't going to serve avocado anymore because they didn't want to be supporting drug cartels. I even thought the avocado here Exactly. Comes. They don't come from Mexico. Mm. So they didn't know where their avocados were coming from. They didn't know the impact. They didn't know the communities. And yet they were making this assumption. So it's about understanding where your food comes from and what the impacts are. Because if there isn't an involvement of drug cartels in South African avocados. So if that's where your supply chain is coming from, then you don't need to to stop purchasing them. And similarly, you know, I think it's it's kind of an interesting tension, you know, do you boycott Mexican avocados? But well, I don't think the Mexican drug cartels are going to think, <laughs> oh, okay, well, you know, consumers in New York City aren't buying my avocados anymore. I know what I'll do. I'll stop being violent. Um, yeah. I think, you know, it just, it, it's not an effective tool, I think it's much more about looking, kind of encouraging those supply chains to look at the integrity of where mm. they're coming from and, and how they're purchasing them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I agree with that sentiment. And in terms of um, like the environmental impact that it has in Mexico is kind of significant, as you said, um, some species like the monarch butterfly. Yeah, so Michoacan is the um, breeding ground of the monarch butterfly. And so when you're seeing the biosphere, which is the sort of um, national park in Michoacan that is there to protect the monarch butterfly, to protect the jaguar, you're seeing that kind of being destroyed as as communities move into that region for agriculture. Um, and so you're seeing kind of slash and burn where people mm. go in and destroy the habitat of the monarch butterfly because they need to eat because the avocado plantation has expanded into all of their farmland. And so they've been displaced and they have to go and, and find some land somewhere else. Um, and so you get that sort of perpetual tension of, of, you know, it's not necessarily that the avocado plantations are cutting down the trees and destroying yeah. the environment, the, 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 that national park or the... Um, the habitat it's that kind of knock-on effect that they're they're displacing local farmers who are producing for local food systems so then those farmers have to go somewhere else somewhere else yeah so we are in um, 2003 mm -hmm. we all eat avocado maybe once twice a week probably at home where do we go from here what's uh, what's your book suggesting that the future of avocado? Um, so I think that there's ways that we as consumers can start to make better choices, but we don't really have a kind of panacea at the moment. It's all about sort of trade-offs. So the, the problem is that unless you live in Crete or Spain or in South Africa or right next to an avocado production in Mexico, you're not going to be able to have a relationship with your farmer who is producing your avocados for you. So you're going to have to make choices around what which ones you're buying from the supermarket. Um, so we need supermarkets to kind of look at where they're sourcing their food from and look at the environmental impacts that they have um, and make sort of more sustainable choices that mitigate those those impacts. If people want to choose a more environmentally sustainable avocado, choosing an organic one is going to be your best option. Obviously, organic has requirements, legal requirements, um, that reduce the impact of the production on the planet. But it doesn't look at... Um, workers or, or the sort of social side of it. And it also makes it a lot more expensive. People who want to eat what is a very healthy food mm. might not be willing or able um, to spend the price premium of buying an organic avocado. So I think it, it's about looking at that whole kind of system and seeing where you as a consumer put your, your focus and your attention, because everyone's different. I might really care about the carbon footprint. So for me, I'm going to say, well, actually, the smallest carbon footprint is going to be me buying avocados from Spain because they haven't had to travel quite so far. But for somebody else, it might be the social impact. And so therefore, they want to buy them from a cooperative in Peru because they know that they've been grown in a way that benefits the community um, and has that kind of fair trade element to them. Um, so it's a really kind of personal decision mm. about your own preferences. And it's about kind of educating yourself on your avocado and and 
where it comes from and how it's produced. Great. What do you think the reader should take from your book if there was some message? It, yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, the message is it's not the avocado's fault. From really the arrival of um, the conquistadors in Spain, it, the avocado has become a product of our society and, and we have manipulated it and changed its production and changed the way it is grown to reflect our society. So demonizing a fruit is a bit ridiculous. And what you actually need to do is look at the system that sits behind it and consider how that impacts the way it's produced. Yeah. I mean, it's a globalized uh, commodity now. And like other globalized commodities, they have their issues and we have to change all this, all this different stuff. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But I think with other global commodities like soy or corn, for example, we don't really see it in the supermarket. Or palm oil. Or palm oil. You know, we don't, you don't go out to Morrison's and buy yourself a vat of palm oil, mm. but you do go and buy yourself an avocado. And I think that immediacy makes it more of a focus point mm. um, and draws some attention to the avocado in a way that maybe some of the other commodities slip under the, <laughs> slip under notice. Yeah, that makes sense. And I suppose if we can, and we should change the way we do things with avocado, then then we can apply that same principle to other yeah. food systems. Yeah, so t to me, my book is more an examination of food systems and globalized food systems today using the avocado as a hook to discuss that than it is specifically because I am so obsessed with one fruit that I decided <laughs> to dedicate 70,000 words to it. You know, a lot of the tensions that I look at, like in the shipping industry, for example, and how infrastructure arises to move foods around the world, mm. that, that's true of everything. I mean, if you take a container ship, it's not just got avocados on it. It's got your bananas. It's got your coffee. It's got your, your cars, your clothes. It's got everything on them. Um, so it is much more about the whole system yeah. that provides us these foods. Yeah, and also about uh, free trade agreements. Your book talks about uh, NAFTA in North America. So th there's a huge scope there for, for the reader to, to find out how, how this all play Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, NAFTA, free trade agreements, that can be really difficult for people to like wrap their heads around. It's it's complicated and it's public policy and economic policy and it's it's not easy. But using the avocado as kind of a bit of a hook can explain how that complexity sort of impacted people. And so how the avocado, the arrival of NAFTA changed avocado production in California, changed it in Florida, changed it in Mexico, and, and what that meant for all of the people mm. that were involved in that supply chain. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. That was a very enlightening talk. <laughs> it was great to be here. And um, your book is coming out? It's coming out on the 24th of November, and you can pre-order it on Amazon and on bookshop.org already so you can brilliant ahead of time <laughs> fantastic thank you so much thank you thanks for listening i've been thomas dinas and this was the delicious legacy podcast see you soon for another archaeogastronomical adventure bye